No, no, we can have the power of God, the presence of God, but still have issues. And when this person ends up disappointing us, they're not superheroes, you know. They're not every woman. We get disappointed. And the first thing we do is withdraw. Then we begin to criticize. Leah is trying to connect to a broken man who finally has a job, finally has a home, but he's not giving her intimacy because he can't give it. And when she doesn't get her needs met from her man, she tries to get her intimacy needs met through childbearing. In verse 32, she gives her children names and it gives her a window into her soul. The first son, Reuben, she says, It is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. Her next child, Simon, means the Lord has heard that I am not loved. He has gave me this one too. Then Levi, now at last my husband will attach to me. She wants the bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She's a desperate housewife crying out for attention. And then she finally gets to the place. When she has her fourth son, she names him Judah, and she says, this time I will praise the Lord. Leah thought that maybe if she was prettier, maybe if she were thinner, maybe if I can give him some children, maybe he will love me. I have to change who I am so I can get what he cannot give. I wish he would see me. I wish he would love me. I wish he would cherish me, cheer me, accept me, pay attention to me. Give me something. (laughs) Jacob failed. Jacob failed because of comparison and competition. What did I say? Comparison and competition. And hear this. This is the thing about it. It's natural. You read James Dobson, Gary Chapman, the first level of love isn't soul to soul, spirit to spirit, but eye to body. It's natural to compare. But if you leave it there, he compared Leah to Rachel. And he is seeing in Rachel what he does not have in Leah. And he's seeing in Leah what he does not have in Rachel. When you read the description of Leah, it just says her defects. He is projecting his own self-hatred. He's comparing them. But also because of competition. Even though Rachel is prettier than Leah, she is jealous. She got the man. But she's jealous because she can't bear children. Childbearing in the entire book of Genesis is paramount because your son could be the Messiah. And if you don't have children, it was believed that you were under the curse of God. Leah has low self-esteem because of her looks, and Rachel has low self-worth because of her sterility. Leah says to Rachel, if you want to be like me, why are you putting me down? If you want to be like me, but you want me to feel bad about it, You see, that's the irony and tragedy of prejudice. You're jealous of a person that you hate. Ladies who are judged based upon external features get low self-esteem and low self-worth from men who are projecting their own low self-esteem and their own low self-worth. And it's a vicious cycle that, that has to be broken. Men who are intimidated by successful women, they will will try to to, to hit on them, but they can't really get intimate. When 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 they start a relationship, they'll start to demean them. I wish you looked like this. I wish you would do that. You don't do well. Broken men trying to break successful women. It's a cycle. Judging on the outward appearance because you are insecure about who you are. 
And he got it from his father and his mother. When I was 11 years old, I came across a disease called cancer. I hate the word. I just hate the sound of the word. My foster mother contracted, was diagnosed with cancer eight times throughout her life. But the first time was in 1991. It turned my world upside down. She was diagnosed when I was just getting stable back in the home. It was already awkward being a foster child of a woman in her early 60s, taking me shopping, trying to take me to the barber shop. I'm like, she, she, she not my mother. She, she my grandmother. She just taking care of me. But when she was diagnosed with cancer, my world turned upside down. How will people treat me is what I thought, because she has cancer. Not will she die, not will she get better, but how will people look at me? At first, she stayed home after she was discharged. And, and we bought her a lazy boy because she didn't have the strength to go up and down the stairs because of the chemotherapy and the radiation. I was happy that she was home. Uh, but I hated it when she bought the wigs and when she bought the hat because I was worried about how I would look. My source of shame was a source of victory for her. She's still alive to wear wigs and hats, but I'm worried about how I will look with her. Albeit self-conscious, she smiled when she saw her bald head because she knew that her cancer was in remission. But I was ashamed because of how it would make me look at church. The world was on my shoulders at the age of 11 because of cancer. But when she went to church, I was trembling because I didn't know what she was going to do. I, I got dressed and I, and I came downstairs and I said, thank you, Jesus, because she had on the wig and she had on the hat that she never wore before the cancer. Uh, the church, when the springtime came and the hat began to trap heat, she took the hat off and left it in the car. I said, all right, all right, that, that's cool. A, few more, a couple more months went by and the summer came and she said, brother, I, I love this church. People began, began to talk. Is that weed? Because people didn't know that she had cancer. Papa, but when she took the wig off, the day she, she, she was praising God that she was able to take the wig off and to show her mini afro. She said, brother, these people don't, don't appreciate my hair. They can go on about their business. I have been saved from death. The ones who are uncomfortable, they can kick rocks and go about their day. You don't know what I've been through. You look at my hair and make assumptions. You don't know that I had chemotherapy and radiation. I almost died. I'm glad I got me some hair. I don't have the money to get it curled and to get it relaxed, but I have some hair on my head. It was a sign of victory for her, but it was a source of shame for me. You see, Jacob... He judged her attractiveness by what was wrong with her. And I judged my foster mother's beauty because of the length of her hair or lack thereof. And I want to say something. We've been doing this not just in the black community, in the Asian community, in the Hispanic community. Both men and women judge based upon appearance. You know where we got it from? The European culture in the Middle Ages that went from country to country, to Africa, to India, to China, to Australia, and put people down based upon how they look. We have been told if we don't look a certain way or have certain features, then, then you're not pretty. You put me down but you spend billions of dollars getting injections to look like what you hate. 
put in Botox trying to make your lips look bigger, but, but you try to put me down. Yeah. Because I'm born with it. Yeah. You must be crazy to think that I'm going to judge myself so you can feel better about yourself. Don't judge me if my hair is short or not short enough, or short enough but not straight enough, long enough but not curly enough. My mother said, you didn't pay for my hair appointments anyway. What she was saying was, I am not my hair. Yeah. 